Every day, your heart beats 100,000 times and your blood travels 12,000 miles. Egyptians believed it wasn't just blood that travelled. They believed that the heart and other organs had wills of their own and could move around independently inside the body. In the 4th century BC, Aristotle, who by all accounts looked like a cross between a hipster and Rory McGrath, said the heart was the seat of intelligence, motion and sensation, and that it was a hot, dry organ. Other organs, he thought, like the brain and liver, merely existed to keep the heart cool. Around 275 BC, a guy called Erasistratus almost figured out the principle of circulation, but thought that the heart pumped air containing the animal spirit around the body. Before you write him off as a dunce, it's worth noting that after death, the heart and arteries don't contain blood as it pools in the veins. So this theory held up for about 500 years until Galen, shown here having just walked into a plate glass window, started prodding about in hearts. He said, the heart is, as it were, the hearthstone and source of the innate heat by which the animal is governed. I could wish they weren't all Greeks. I can only really do German and French accents. Galen felt the heart was secondary to the liver in importance since it didn't produce any humour. The heart continued to be studied in Europe and Islam where in the 1200s Ibn al-Nafiz correctly traced pulmonary circulation but it wasn't very popular at parties and no one paid any attention. So it wouldn't be until 1628 when English physicist William Harvey wrote on the circulation of blood that we would know that. The heart's one role is the transmission of the blood and its propulsion by means of the arteries to the extremities everywhere. He once restarted an arrested pigeon's heart by flicking it. Very scientific, isn't it? Flick it. He realised that blood had to be circulated when he calculated the volume of blood being pumped by the heart. The irony being that he could have learned from any butcher that cutting an artery would leave an animal completely exsanguinated in a matter of minutes. Amazingly, the effect of electricity on the heart was being researched as early as the 1770s. A British physician called Squires stimulating the heart of a young girl with electricity in 1774. And a Danish physicist called Abildgard reanimating a chicken after trying electric shocks on various bits of it. Don't play with your food. In 1797, Alexander von Humboldt found a dead bird in his garden and brought it back to life by placing electrodes in its beak and rectum. He then tried the experiment on himself with less favourable results. And during the French Revolution, Bichat and Neeston used electricity to restart the hearts of some of the many beheaded bodies that were cluttering up the place. Astonishingly, pacemakers were being trialled as early as the late 1920s, developed independently in Australia and America. In 1957, a dog with an artificial heart survives for 90 whole minutes. And in 1963, the first patent for an artificial heart is granted to a man called Paul Winchell, a ventriloquist. Now there's a novelty act. Winchell's work is aided by Dr. Henry Heimlich. Yes, that Heimlich! Four years later, a South African called Louis Washkansky survived for 18 days after the world's first successful heart transplant. Only in the 1980s did the procedure become more successful and widespread, and now 300 are carried out in the UK every year. Did you know that if you were to take a single heart cell and put it in a Petri dish, it would have a pulse? And if you took one from another heart, it would have a different pulse, but that if you then pushed them together so that they were touching, they'd synchronize. That's kind of beautiful, isn't it?